Good evening and welcome to the Adams County Children's Advocacy Center's Brighter Tomorrow Speaker Series. The Adams County Children's Advocacy Center is a local nonprofit organization dedicated to a community where children are safe, families are strong, and child victims can become children again. The Advocacy Center has served Adams County community for 17 years and provides family and victim advocacy services after reports of child abuse have been made, intensive child abuse prevention and mental health education programs in all school districts in Adams County, along with support for child and adult abuse survivors, mental health therapy services and support groups. The Brighter Tomorrow Speaker Series is intended to bring discussion of topics that help children, adolescents, their caregivers, and the general community. The series is held the second Thursday of every month and features diverse topics. Registration is free on our website at kidsagaincac.org, Eventbrite, or our Facebook page. Today's presentation is suitable for parents, caregivers, and the general community, but the information is not geared towards children. A question and answer session will be held at the conclusion of the presentation. Please submit questions through the Q&A function on your screen or through Facebook comments. This evening, we are excited to welcome presenter Amanda evans fried Amanda is an art therapist certified in trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy. Over the past decade, Amanda has worked as an art therapist specializing in serving trauma victims and has spent the last eight years as a trauma therapist at the Adams County Children's Advocacy Center in Gettysburg. She currently sees adults in her private art therapy practice in Camp Hill. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, everyone, for attending this evening's CAC Speaker Series um, through the Children's Advocacy Center. Um, I hope to provide you with a brief insight into the world of art therapy this evening. My goal is for you to walk away with knowledge on what art therapy is, who art therapy can help, and how I've integrated art therapy into my work with trauma survivors. Um, to get started this evening, I hope everyone found the link that Ms. Jen had sent out for the art experiential, which is our blank mandala. Um, if you did not get to download or print this, no worries. If you have a sp scrap piece of paper and something circular in object form, you can go ahead and trace that on your blank piece of paper and follow along. Um, art therapists use mandalas for a variety of purposes, but for today, I hope that you can just create um, and sit and doodle in your mandala throughout the presentation. I often use mandalas to help center and allow you to stay active and present. For those of you that would be comfortable sharing your mandalas, oh, I hope that you can take a picture of them with or without you and submit it to our Facebook page. I'd love to see what you created this evening. So jumping right into a little bit of mandalas and their origin, um, the word mandala literally means circle. It originated first in the first century BCE in India, our symbol of the universe and its ideal form and helps people use meditation to envision how they achieve the perfect self. However, the circular imagery known as mandalas have been adapted and can be found in religions and cultures all over the world. We find mandalas in everyday life, and most recently, the mandala and the broken mandala have made a significant impact in the modern Western culture through tattooing. For art therapy purposes, you can create your mandala however you want. Here are a couple examples of mandalas that have been made through art therapy. Don't overthink it, just kind of start. We like to start in the center of the mandala and then work our way out to the edges. There are no rules with these mandalas. Just stay in the barrier or break the barrier if you want. Use all the space or leave some of the space open. In art therapy, mandalas are used for a variety of reasons. The general idea is a natural form to work within as a visual representation that is often seen throughout history, extending to the origin of the universe. The mandala emerges as spontaneously as a sign of change or transformation. In art therapy, we often associate it with the feeling of wholeness, growth, or the birth or emergence of something new. It can also signal a new understanding of the self. So 
So a very common question I get asked when people ask me what I do for a living and I tell them I'm an art therapist, they're like, well, what is that? So I added here the American Art Therapy Association's technical description of and definition of what is art therapy. It is an integrative mental health and human services profession that enriches the lives of individuals, families, and communities through the act of art making and creative process. We apply psychological theory and human experience within a psychotherapeutic relationship. It's kind of really wordy. Um, so basically, I tell people that it's a hybrid profession that combines art making and psychology. I explain that the artwork creates a third person in the room and into the therapeutic relationship, and that art therapists are trained just like any other counselor, social worker, or psychologist at our basic level. We learn all the basic principles of psychology and enhance our clinical skills through practicums. Um, so the clinical work of art therapy, and what does that mean? Art therapy effectively supports personal and relational treatment goals through active art making, creative processes, applied psychological theory and human experience within a psychotherapeutic relationship. So again, it is just a hybrid of making of artwork and psychology. We often use it to improve cognitive and sensory motor functions, cultivate emotional resilience, reduce and resolve conflicts and stress, foster self-esteem and self-awareness, as well as promote insight. And we advance societal and ecological change. The next question I often get is who are art therapists and what kind of training did we have to go through? Well, to become an art therapist, you must have your bachelor's in either studio art, psychology, or another related field such as human services. Um, from there, you have to achieve your master's in art therapy, either through a master's in art or a master's in um, science program. Then you become a registered art therapist by engaging in 1,000 or 1,500 direct client contact hours with 100 to 150 supervision hours in addition. So we go through a lot of post-school training um, in the field being heavily supervised in order to become a registered art therapist. Once you become a registered art therapist, you can sit for your board certification, which is a really long five-hour exam testing your knowledge on not only art materials, clinical work, psychology principles, um, as well as specific questions related to the art therapy field. Once you've passed that, in the state of Pennsylvania, you can apply for your license in professional counseling or your LPC as a licensed professional counselor. These are all things that I currently hold as a professional art therapist. So the next question I get asked is what do art therapists actually do? Um, I love this visual because it talks a little bit about what people think art therapists do. And the most common response I get is, oh, you cool, you teach people how to draw and paint. Well, I do or I can, I have those skills as a studio art person um, to teach someone how to do that, but that's not the only thing that I do. The other most common answer I get is, oh, so I draw something and you analyze it and you see what's wrong with me. And whereas mm -hmm. analytical perception and art and giving analysis and analyzing the artwork is something that I have some training in, that's not actually what we do, or and it's not the entirety of what we do, especially being person or child-centered. We want to know what the client thinks of that artwork. It's not all about me or another art therapist analyzing that artwork. So what do we actually do? Well, we help the client or you express emotions through art. We hold space in a clear setting that allows an individual to be vulnerable and to share emotions in a non-judgmental zone. 
we give unconditional support and no, no judgment zone. We help you find your own meaning in your art. So like I said before, I am not here to tell you what your artwork means. I'm here to help you find what you believe that your artwork means and take that back and apply it to the aspects of your life that you've come into therapy to change. We support your goals and needs through the creative processes. So again, when you come in for art therapy, we often ask, why are you here? What do you want out of this? And we set your goals around that. And I, as the art therapist, helps facilitate you to achieve those goals. The third most common question I get is, well, can you even get a job in that? And if you can get a job in that, where are you working? So art therapists are actually everywhere. We are not necessarily advertised as being everywhere, but we are in a lot of different settings and work with a lot of different populations. Um, some of the settings that art therapists work in are outpatient mental health facilities and community-based art therapy. We also work in residential treatment faci facilities for children and adults. You can find art therapists through family-based services, family functional therapy services, and intensive family services. You can also find art therapists working as forensic art therapists at inpatient and partial units and hospitalizations, private practical practices, and also in the medical community, such as oncology units and also um, in re rehabilitation centers for addiction. We work with not just children, we work with adults, children, individuals, groups, and families. We work with individuals that have developmental disabilities, mental and behavioral health, people who struggle with Alzheimer's and other neurological impairments, as well as support individuals on their journey through healing of grief and loss, trauma survivors, and those suffering from addiction. So people often ask me a little bit more about art therapy and how I got into becoming an art therapist and why I chose the track that I did. And to really answer that question, I have to explain the, tools, the two schools of thought of art therapy and a little bit where art therapy came from. So back in the early 1920s, Hans Prinzhorn, who was an assistant doctor at the Heidelberg University Hospital in Germany, began becoming interested in some of the patient's artwork that they would do on their free time. He really believed that there was more to these um, patients' imagery than just what met the eye or just random scribblings. He really believed that it could give a window into what, what the individual was suffering from and help them as doctors support these patients and hopefully find healing and a better understanding of them. This was a really interesting concept for the 1920s. This came around the time that we were looking at um, Freud's uh, outlook on the dehumanization of individuals with mental health disabilities. Um, these individuals that were kind of locked up in hospital settings um, and what we know as state penitentiaries at times, um, they really believed that we could help these individuals in a different way and treat them as rehumanization, um, really looking at treating them as humans again instead of just individuals that were kind of, quote, crazy. Creative art could be understood as an illustration of mental health or disturbance, this was a huge jumping point into starting art therapy. Mar Margaret Nomberg and Edith Kramer are two of our founding mothers of art therapy. But just like everything, they had a difference of opinion. So how is art therapy used? Well, today we break it down into the two schools of thought. We have art as therapy and we have art psychotherapy. Art as therapy is the idea that the process 
of creating art and art making is a therapeutic tool that helps you in the process of healing in and of itself. Art psychotherapy really believes that it is a form of expressive therapy based on the idea that art is a vehicle for symbolic communication. Therefore, art psychotherapy does have a little bit more of the analytical component. Looking at and analyzing artwork and using it as something that shows us an insight into the individual. The art therapy is divided into these two categories, but depending on the situation, the client that I'm with, or that client's goals, they can be used together or individualized. Another common question I get is, okay, you're an art therapist. My friend's an art teacher. What is the difference? Well, that's such a great question because art therapy is very different than going to an art class. Art therapy is facilitated by a professionally trained art therapist. It involves a therapeutic relationship between the therapist and the client, and it takes place in a safe and confidential space. The main goal is always self-expression. Art supplies are used as tools for the self-expression. There's no right or wrong way to make things or to use art materials. The form is usually on the I'm um, sorry, the focus is usually on the creative process. Artwork is seen as a reflection or extension of its creator, and it is used for the sole purpose of communication. Communicating maybe what the word what words cannot describe that that individual is feeling or has experienced. Art class is facilitated as, by a skilled art teacher or instructor. It involves a student teacher relationship. It takes place in a classroom or studio space that very often is not confidential. There are other individuals there. The main goal is to learn how to make something. Art supplies are used in the specific ways to accomplish the task or the skill that that individual is trying to teach someone. There may be a certain recommended technique or a right way to do things. That is so important. You're trying to teach a skill and there's a correct and an incorrect way to accomplish that skill. The focus is usually on the final art product and the artwork is evaluated for its formal, formal qualities based on the elements and principles of design. So in short, art therapy is about the process. It is not about the product. Art therapists do not care if you are good at art or if you have any artistic ability whatsoever. That is not the focus, nor is our focus to try to teach you how to be an artist. In an art class, that is the opposite. One of our most current influential art therapists in the world today is Kathy Malchiotti. And I, re I refer to her books and teachings quite a bit. There is an idea that art therapy is all about drawing from within, that art and therapy equals the process and the product. So continuing from art teacher versus art therapist, we talk about who interprets the art, which is a common question. We go back to the art as art therapy versus art psychotherapy, but the ultimate goal is the same. We provide a safe space for an individual to achieve growth and healing. For visual processing, the art is a, is a third person in the room with the client and the therapist. The art tells its own story that came from within the person, bringing the unconscious into consciousness. Sometimes there isn't words for what someone is feeling or have experienced. Here's where art can be one's voice. It can often be easier to draw feelings or experiences rather than say them out loud. Trauma survivors often hold their trauma in their body instead of in their brain. We talk about Vander, Bessel van der Kolk, who talks about the body keeping score and our trauma residing within our body, which causes somatic experiences and, and symptomology. Art therapy creates an emotional release. A physiological term is catharsis. 
meaning the cleansing or purging. In therapy, it refers to expression and discharge of strong emotions for relief. We use art as an emotional release. We take it out of our body and out of our mind and we put it down on paper or on a contained surface where we can literally transfer our emotions from being held with inside of ourselves and give it its own light and give us freedom from those emotions. We have creative relationships, therapeutic relationship, a facilitator, facilitator or a witness to the transformation that can occur through art making is central to healing, Re reparation and healing. Art making is for everyone. There is no artistic talent needed. We process each piece individually and it is all about what the individual created. Again, not about the product or how it looks. Art therapy is also a sensory experience. Going back to Bessel van der Kolk and the, and the body keeping score and having those emotions and feelings remain within our body is something that we can release through sensory engagement. Each art material provides its own unique quality and its own sensory experience when we use it and apply it to paper or that contained um, surface. Some of the materials art therapists use are um, mask making in our objectives. So masks are so incredible. They give us the idea of an inside and an outside. These type of tasks can be used by art therapists to provide a canvas for an individual to create what their outside self looks like, what they show to the world or what they let other people see. On the inside or the reverse part of the mask is maybe what they hold within, what they don't share with other people. This is a great tool to use to help an individual start to process what they show the world versus what they keep inside. And typically when we work with trauma survivors, which is my main focus, that we look at what that individual doesn't want to share with the outside. Typically, that is associated with shame or blame or guilt or fear. And those are all things that can be scary to put out there. It is also things that it can be scary to talk to someone about, or perhaps you don't even have words for them and feel silly trying to express them through language. Our artwork gives us the freedom to transpose those feelings and that information onto something and outside of ourselves. Our therapists often use other materials and techniques when they work with individuals and groups in therapy. Um, the mandala, like you guys are all making there at home, is can be an individual activity. It can also be a group activity. Um, each individual makes their own piece of the mandala and puts it together to signal, signify unity within the group. Collage can be a powerful technique and is often really um, adapted in a lot of scenarios where individuals feel like they have no artistic ability whatsoever. And the idea of drawing or painting is overwhelming. Pre-cut imagery and words can be very helpful in someone to organize and express themselves without feeling the pressure to have some sort of artistic ability. We also use polarized imagery a lot in art therapy. Um, the dichotomy of two opposites can also can often spark great conversation in terms of what an individual is going through, where they've been, where they want to go, who they are, who they want to be, who they were to who they are now, or who they see themselves as in the future. 
it, these all these tools can help to achieve an individual's goal for therapy, whatever that goal may be, whether it be self increasing self-esteem, gaining new or additional coping mechanisms or skills, increasing insight or processing traumatic experiences that led um, to their turn to maybe substance or alcohol abuse and addiction. I use this image a lot um, in almost all of my presentations um, because it's such a beautiful display of one person's visual response to what they felt like when they went through therapy with an art therapist. So as you can see, the first image, the individual is sharpening the pencil and the head is full of these like crazy lines that are filled with anxiety, um, perhaps feeling overwhelmed or unable to put memories, fragmented memories into um, a linear form. The second image shows this individual starting to take all those thoughts and feelings swirling around in their head and putting it down on paper. And the third image, of course, shows that individual being able to take a deep breath and breathe because they've been relieved of this burden of all these things kind of swirling around in their head and they put it onto paper. They're letting the art materials actually carry that burden for them now. Now, I would love to say that every art therapy session is as simple as this. And the truth is, this doesn't always happen in a single therapy session. Perhaps it takes time and multiple sessions till an individual feels this way. But this is this person's response um, to their experience going to art therapy. Okay. So I would be remiss to not include a little bit about my work as an art therapist. I am a trauma-focused therapist, as Ms. Jen pointed out earlier. Um, a lot of my work in art therapy is working with children, and now I work primarily with adults, um, adult trauma survivors in an outpatient setting in my private practice. Um, currently, there are some really amazing art therapists in our field doing great work partnering with neurologists to study the brain and how art therapy impacts different parts of the brain in a positive way. A good bit of trauma work is dedicated to forming new, new neuro pathways in the brain that essentially rewire our brain to form healthier coping mechanisms, positive cognitive behavioral results, and decrease somatic symptoms. So I feel like I have to give a little bit of a introduction to trauma and the brain. So the American Art Therapy Association states that kinesthetic, sensory, perceptual, and symbolic opportunities invite alternative modes of receptive and expressive communication, which can circumvent the limitations of language. That's a really fancy way of just saying that by physically creating art, we can get around the barrier of language to express ourselves and express the trauma that we maybe have been through. I have an image up of the brain, and I want to talk about for just a moment three parts of the brain that are so important when I think about my work with trauma survivors. We think about the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, and also the brain stem. Why on earth are these important? Well, the brain stem is our old brain or our reptilian brain. It is the part of the brain that we share with every other mammal walking or crawling on this earth. The amygdala is also known as the seat of our emotions. And it's this part of the brain where our emotions lie and where they stay. Our prefrontal cortex. That is important because that is our seat of reason. It is also very close to the part of the brain that holds language. So these three parts of the brain are important when working in art therapy with trauma survivors. 
because we need to know in what order these parts of the brain, quote, light up. So when someone has gone through a traumatic experience and they experience a trauma trigger or a reenaction of something that causes them to remember a part of the trauma, the part of the brain that lights up first is the brainstem. This part of the brain is in is responsible for survival. Um, it not only manages our body temperature and our heart rate, it also is responsible for all those other automatic functions. So when you lay down and go to sleep, it is the part of the brain that stays awake and makes sure that you still breathe while you are sleeping. So the brainstem is important because this is the part of the brain that is reactionary. This is the part of the brain that is literally responsible for your survival. So when we have a sensory trigger, when we see someone who reminds us of somebody who we've had a traumatic experience with, this is the part of the brain that clicks on and tells us that we should have a trauma response, such as fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. I'm sure many of you know that fight is pretty obvious. You are ready to fight your way out of a situation. Flight you're ready to flee or run away from the situation. Freeze, you become immobile, can't speak, um, literally frozen in time. Or fawn. Fawning is a little more complex, but it's where you align yourself with that individual to ensure your safety. Or you fawn to whatever you think that individual wants in order for you to remain safe. When we experience a traumatic trigger, the part of the brain that goes offline is the prefrontal cortex. Now, this also goes offline when we are experiencing a trauma for the first time. When we experience the trauma for the first time, this seat of reason, this area that holds our language capabilities shuts down and all of our energy stays within the brainstem and a little bit in the amygdala. This is why when an individual experiences a trauma trigger, they may react in a way that is maybe not normal for them, or they, they act in a way that others may deem, well, they're being irrational. This is the reason that people will often react and jerk away or swing at somebody or try to push someone away. And the moment after they do that and their prefrontal cortex comes back online and they realize that their trigger was not actually a threat, very often people will say that they're sorry or they are feel embarrassed or guilty about their actions. But as a trauma therapist and an art trauma therapist, I know that that is not something that they had reasonable control over. So again, why is this important? This is important because we know that trauma memories in the brain from our neurology friends, that memories are stored in a fragmented state. Their um, trauma memories are stored in all different areas and they are not linear. They're experienced through the senses. Trauma triggers come from, but from sight, smell, taste, sound, or feel. We know that they are not, none of these are stored in the part of the brain responsible for language and that they're stored within our body and our sensory experiences. In extreme cases, we know that neurosynapses have formed in a way that encourages maladaptive behaviors and thought processes or cognitions. So very often individuals will fall into that um, cycle of um, self-doubt or negative self-talk instead of positive affirmation on themselves when they after they've experienced a trauma. How do we get those out of the brain? Well, through art therapy, we know that creating art and working with an art therapist will actually allow space for those memories to come out onto paper and that we don't need to use necessarily words to process them. 
remember, if we're trying to access these memories that are fragmented and stored throughout our body and only in parts of our brain and parts of our brain that is not responsible for our language capabilities, why on earth would we feel that we could just simply talk about that? Now, there are therapies out there that I am in strong support of that are talk therapy, and they may be right for some people. But very often, I run into individuals who find that art therapy is easier to put it on paper and then find words to it instead of trying to recall that memory and put words to it in that moment. Remember, if we're triggered, our language is offline, our, ration, our rational thinking is offline, and we are in survival mode. Now, very often I get asked, okay, so how can people process a traumatic experience or any experience without using language? How does that actually help the brain? I stole this image from Dr. Yarrow, who is a wonderful supporter of children advocacy centers all across the United States. And she had shared this in a training and I really liked it. So I wanted to share it with you guys today. And when we talk about storytelling and the brain, we talk about how the therapeutic relationship affects the brain in a positive way. We have neural coupling. So basically making the story your own. We have a dopamine effect, which helps you remember despite the fragmented memories when dopamine is released in the brain when you have created a, a story that you have taken control of and that is your own. We talk about cortex activity and engaging story helps light up multiple areas of the brain to activate them all at one time. So remember how I just said about the trauma brain and having that rational thinking part being shut down. For some people, they become numb and those emotions even go offline. And then you're just left with your survival mechanisms. Taking your trauma and putting it into a storytelling can actually help relight up some of these parts of the brain and make them aware and conscious of your trauma. At the same time, they are calming down the brainstem, making the brainstem less reactive, not lighting up as much, and keeping you out of that survival mode and into rational and cognitive thinking. Here are some examples of art therapy working with trauma survivors. The first image, we have an individual who was sharing what it felt like when they experienced a trauma trigger within their body. And what their body was feeling. Most trauma survivors can't quite put that into words or it takes time to help them find the correct words for that feeling. The center image is an image of an individual, a young child of how she felt after the trauma. And our final image is that of an altered book. Altered bookmaking is a process that a lot of art therapists implement. It can be used with trauma survivors and it can be used with individuals coming to art therapy for alternative reasons. It literally helps you take a story that was already once created, deconstruct it and reconstruct it into your own. So just like we talked about the dopamine levels and how storytelling can affect the brain in a positive way, Recreating a book or a story into an altered book is a helpful way to take control back and make the story your own. For any of you, any of you who are interested in learning more about art therapy, are interested in maybe taking on the path of becoming an art therapist, or perhaps you joined today because you were interested in attending art therapy, but wasn't really sure what it is or what it's all about, I encourage you to visit the American Art Therapy Association website and look at a little bit about more about what art therapy is 
where you can get hooked up with an art there, a certified and registered art therapist. And also there are tr always trainings and other literature options out there to expand your knowledge on art therapy. I have included a couple books, mostly by Kathy Malchioti and also by Juliet King, um, which is my newest favorite book, um, The Art Therapy, Trauma, and Neuroscience, that really talks more about art therapy and neuroscience and treating trauma survivors, if that is of interest with you, of you. I am also available to answer questions that you may have, or if you are interested in attending um, art therapy through outpatient modality. My private practice email is listed here as arttherapyyorkamanda at gmail.com. And I believe that wraps up my presentation. Um, open for questions, Miss Jen, if there were any. I don't have any questions for you now. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jen, for having me this evening. I hope everyone who um, watches or has attended feels free to reach out if they have any questions and, and continues exploring what art therapy is. Thank you again to Amanda for a truly helpful and informative presentation and for your time today. To our audience, thank you for your time. We hope that you have learned some new mental health coping strategies for you and your children and teens in your life and have learned more about the possibility of using art therapy in your own life. A recording of this webinar will be available on the Adams County Children's Advocacy Center Facebook page and YouTube channel. We hope you will visit our website kidsagaincac.org for more information about our organization for child abuse prevention tips, mental health education, and our upcoming support groups and other events. Thank you for joining us. Be safe. Good night.